introduce first the two sides that we're going to have in this debate and tell you a little bit about how it works. The way it works is like this. We are going to do four rounds of debate. Each side, each of our combatants, will have two minutes to present an argument, and the other side presents a counter-argument. At the end of each round, I will ask you to decide the winner. And at the end of the whole thing, you will decide a global winner for which side wins the future. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, that's a little bit better. All right, so now that you know how we're going to do it, here is who we are going to involve. In this corner, we have an attorney at law and the head of data governance at Swisscom. He specializes in intellectual property and IT law as well as data protection law. He has been working to establish an enterprise-wide data ethics framework. I do not know how tall he is or how much he weighs, but please welcome on the side of personalization, Nicola Pasadelis. Associate Professor of Information Systems and Services at the University of Geneva. He focuses on digital rights, policy management, and information security, and has special interests in developing systems informed by principles of enlightened trust and transparency. I also have no idea how tall he is or how much he weighs, but his name is Jean-Henri Moreau. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, I am going to ask you briefly to shake hands, just in case this is our last sign of collegiality. <laughs> All the best. All right, now, we need to decide who's going first, and I know I really probably should not be doing this after the last session, but I'm going to see if, uh... hey Siri, can you do a coin flip? Can you flip a coin, please? <laughs> please toss a coin. <laughs> it is, before I tell you, which side do you want? <laughs> ah, it's tails. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, Jean-Henri, you will be going first, arguing for privacy. I understand that you have some special weapons that you have prepared for the argument. Do you have a, a number of weapons you want to pull up? Absolutely. I will call my weapon number three. All right, weapon number three, please load it and put two minutes on the clock. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so whatever. <laughs> Let's start this by asking ourselves uh, a question. Are we living in an unprecedented time of economic cynicism? Corporations having business models relying on their customer data have no intention whatsoever to change that. Self-regulation of the industry has proven not to work and will never work. We must move away from a deceptive data economy, and everybody's talking about this data economy, towards a more responsible and sustainable data use economy. And the distinction is very fundamental. That's a paradigm shift. Is there room for a new business model not relying on raping customer data, obfuscating algorithms, and calling that personalization? I'd love to hear you on that. I'm done. <laughs> All right. So there, yeah, yeah, please give it up. They're going to feed off your energy, so I want you all to bring it. Remember, you are deciding the fate of this argument. And now, if I can ask you. Number one. Or, oh, all right, you're ready. Okay, if we can get his first weapon up on the screen, and two minutes on the clock arguing for personalization, the time is yours. Friends, who wants to be a number? One person within this crowd nameless, without individuality. Let's talk about human rights. We've come a long, long way in, in mankind's history. 
to fight for personal autonomy and personal freedom. Would you like to give that up? Would you like to be a number, mere data in the age of digitalization? Would you just like to be one of those without any individuality? Would you like to be someone without autonomy or without any meaning within society? That's where digitalization could go. And actually, digitalization is not a threat to human, human, um, human autonomy um, because of personalization. Personalization is actually the key to autonomy. Why? Because we need to make sure in these times that we keep our autonomy, um, even in the age of digitalization. Um, you all know that you have your needs and your properties. Personalization helps us to understand what your needs are and what your properties are. Personalization helps us really to understand what you need. And this is what personalization is all about. That's fine. <laughs> battling not only the argument for privacy, but also a faulty microphone. You've heard the side for personalization, and now I will put it to you, friends, to decide who carried the day in round one. Now you realize if none of you vote for personalization, you have to get off all of the platform services you've been enjoying. <laughs> all right, we're gonna give another 30 seconds here. Number two. Number two, if you can bring it up on the screen and put two minutes on the clock, the time is yours. Guys, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> Personalization is nothing new. And if you do, as if it were new, you're a hypocrite. You all know that when you go to the local bakery, you like to be named by your name. You prefer that the baker knows what kind of bread you, you want to have. And maybe if you're late on Sunday morning because you slept a little bit longer, that he keeps your preferred bread until you come because he knows that you will come. The truth is you're all happy to trade your personal data against the benefits you receive from technology. Obviously Facebook is one of the examples, but there are many, many others. All the apps you use collect data and you're happily giving away your data for the benefits. It gets even worse when it comes to health. There are studies which clearly show that people are most happy to give the data if it's about their health and if it's about curing or diagnosing illnesses. So whenever you think it's all about privacy, the truth is when we look at the mass, it's about personalization. You may not like that truth, but that's what it is. So, Let's think about personalized medicine. Um, as you know, most of the illnesses are a very complex interplay between genetic and environmental causes. In order to know what actually a patient needs to be diagnosed or cured, you need to have data. And the truth is, the more data you have, the better. So, you can go on with a trial and error principle and say, okay, if I have cancer, I just hope that the medication I get will help. Or you can think about going the way of personalized medicine and increase your chances to survive. Increase the chances of a cure being actually effective 
and to stay longer on this planet than maybe if you just stay contrived and error. Think about that. And you, my friend, that is time. You go tell this baby that personalized medicine. You and the baby have to wrap it up. <laughs> You've been called on your hypocrisy. You've been called to consider the future of personalized medicine without personalization. You have been called on the way that you like to have a croissant in the morning from your baker. And you've been called to vote for what you actually believe in rather than what you think you should believe in. But now, there's going to be a counter argument in favor of privacy. Is this your selection? Objection, Your Honor. <laughs> I contend that I fully agree with what you said, but in a way which is respectful <coughs> of the individuality and the, 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 the fact of preserving the privacy of people. This should be a deliberate personal choice. Obviously the baby you're talking about does not have the economy to make this choice. But as in many, many other circumstances in life, until you are a reasonable age, to vote, your parents can assume these responsibilities. I really contend that we can have the world of personalization you're talking about in a way which is privacy preserving. And I'll leave the rest of that for my second round. I'm done. All right. argument perhaps and Just setting us to consider whether there's maybe a false dichotomy established earlier on. I will ask you now to judge the outcomes of round two and find in favor of the argument for privacy or the argument for personalization. Give you another 30 seconds. <laughs> Think about what you've heard. <laughs> the margin is closing. Well, you win an election with that. <laughs> Another 10 seconds to wrap up your voting. All right, it looks like continuing the streak, Sean and me, Martin. Privacy once again takes round two, ladies and gentlemen. And now this time, you have the first shot, so choose your weapon, sir. All right, if we can bring up image four, and another two minutes on the clock, the time is yours to argue for privacy. So, let's dive into this. Let's assume for the sake of the argument, we're talking about large corporations. You're a large telecom operator for this country. If we assume that Swisscom wants to be a good corporate citizen and wants to do good in terms of responsibility, a little bit like, you know, like corporate social responsibility before, if we consider its customers are its most valuable assets, show us some love. You know? <laughs> if you understand that privacy should be at the heart of the business model by design and by default, so I propose you a challenge. The challenge, should you accept it, would be to introduce informed personalization within Swisscom across all its systems and services. Ain't that a fair and responsible offer? I'm done.
He calls it an offer we might also call it a challenge for privacy by design. We've heard an argument for privacy, now we'll hear one for personalization. Choose your weapon, sir. Number three. Bring up number three and another two minutes on the clock to make the argument the time, whoa, is yours. <laughs> you seem to learn, but not quick enough. Let's talk about the privacy dilemma. Maybe you've heard of it? A lot of people talk about privacy. I've been in privacy business since 20 years, and I can tell you, until three years ago, no one cared, okay? And in the last three years, everyone talks about privacy and says how important that is, but they do not live up to it, including you. So, um, you're still a little bit hypocritical, but I think things get better. So, you've got the right to access your data, even with Swisscom. How many of you have ever asked for access? Hands up. I did. We have six million customers all across all the products. We receive less than 100 access requests a year. There is a lot of information uh, available on privacy. Who of you reads it? Who of you clicks yes if he wants to receive the benefit of a service without actually reading all the stuff? So you ask for privacy. Are you really prepared to do the work in order to have real privacy? Or isn't it the truth that you need help? All right. An appeal again for you to vote not what you think you should, but what you actually practice. To ask you what you really believe in and how you demonstrated those beliefs. <laughs> ah. All right. Another 30 seconds to vote. Oh, I hear some politicking and trading of influence now in the room. Ten more seconds. Personalization is holding on to the lead down to the wire. And that poll is closed. We have a new winner of round three personalization. And also now a chance to even the score going into round four, our final round of argumentation. Sir, choose your weapon. Number four. Number four and another two minutes on the clock, please. So guys, now we are talking business. I know what your problems are. And the truth is, privacy and protection of individualism, of autonomy and personal freedom is actually not something all of us can do individually, but it's on the companies to take responsibility. And Swisscom is at the forefront in this country to do that. We've invested more than several millions a year in order to achieve that. We have introduced organizations, processes, policies all across the board. We have trained 19,000 employees with two large trainings only this year. We have a myriad of communication doing internally because whatever you do with processes, it's the people who decide how data at the end is going to be used. We fill an organization with six or seven functions across the group taking care of our privacy. We have defined data owners who have the business responsibility to have the resources needed in order to achieve privacy. We've got over 60 data governance managers spread across the organization who are responsible for making sure that we do the right thing. And last but certainly not least, I've battled nine months within the company in order to have an ethics framework. A data ethics framework with a serious data ethics board which will decide on use cases whether they comply with our values, with an enhanced transparency. We don't build uh, privacy on privacy policies, but actually we inform journalists. We have dedicated websites, dedicated FAQs on our products, and there will be more. We provide the people the right to opt out of several data processes on our customer center. 
if they don't want it, even if it's anonymous, because we think you should be in control of your data, even if it's anonymous. We do a lot to make that happen, and all we do is giving you a hand to protect your own data. We don't rely on you, we don't take responsibility ourselves. Yo. All right. A final argument for personalization and the role of personalization in your data future and that of your business. But we have time for one more argument on the side of privacy. And what is that, five? If we can get image five up with an additional two minutes on the clock, the time is yours to make the argument. Thank you. I do buy into your argument. I, I do understand that things are changing. But what I'm hearing is a lot of KPIs, a lot of numbers. There's definitely actions behind those numbers. I'm sure about that. But I think we should move much faster and much further in a much balder way. To some extent, the party is over. We know today that algorithmic transparency does not deliver what it should be. And if I was mentioning before economic cynicism, I think there's a large part of the problem we're facing today, mm -hmm. which is related to, to corporations who do not necessarily want to stop milking the cow. The business model remains a major issue, and I think we should be careful about that. So, oh, I do understand what you're doing. I do understand the genuinity of what you're trying to achieve. But my proposition my challenge of informed personalization in order to achieve transparency and, information and informational self-determination for people in a transparent way stays. Thank you. All right, all right. You heard your two arguments for round four. Now it is time for you to decide the outcome. And the boats are pouring in. Privacy out to an early lead. I'll give you another 30 seconds to cast those boats. discussion. I hear chatter. I hear people trying to sway their seatmates to vote with them. The future's in your hands. And it looks like with those hands you have cast the majority of votes in round four for privacy. Once again, we have our winner of the fourth round. Well done. Still shaking hands. I'm amazed. Oh, fundamentally, we agree. <laughs> fundamentally. I yeah, so that's an interesting thing we're going to come back to in a moment, I think. But for now, I want to close out the competition, so to speak, the uh, battle of these ideas and these arguments with one final global decision for you all to decide, based on what you've heard today, which one of these arguments are you going to carry forward into the future that you want to shape? I actually do have a trophy just like that in my bag. I'll give it to you at lunch if you win it. I'm <laughs> 
Oh yeah, we're we're gonna address the uh, the implications of these decisions in a moment. The fact that they did just hear from Tristan might have something to do with this as well. All right, another 10 seconds to cast those final votes for who wins the future. Decided in favor of privacy. John Henry, congratulations, my friend. Thank you. But Nicholas, I see this is not dead even, but it's actually it's close. close. It's close. And certainly a lot closer than we were in the first round. So I think we surfaced some new ideas that may have moved the needle a little bit. I'd like to give each of you just 30 seconds or so. If you have anything you would like to leave the room with, based on what they've heard, based on what they've decided, uh, based on what you've thought of the experience here as well. Sure. Uh, you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not surprised, although I find it contradictory for two reasons. First of all, the GDPR, um, which is actually a huge success story, um, very much focuses on data governance for, for the companies. Our problem basically is not privacy as a concept, and it's not about the rights which are available, but it's actually really that companies really, really struggle to, to implement these, these um, structures, the policies, the processes. There are not enough resources to do that in a fair sh uh, period of time. So um, data governance is really the key of the GDPR, point number one. Point number two, uh, when the GDPR was actually enacted, um, all the regulators across the world were absolutely okay with the thought that it does not what it's supposed to do. Um, the privacy dilemma I was referring to earlier is really a problem, okay? And uh, regulation, as I see it, probably in 10 years' time will move away from this informational autonomy, which is the concept of today, and actually move more into a governance-based um, a governance-based regulation because there's so many things going on in digitalization we cannot control. It's too quick, it's too complex. And therefore, fundamentally, the, the, the basis of privacy is probably ill-founded nowadays and we need to find new solutions. So when I say you're a little bit contradictory in what you say, I still believe very firmly in that. But I do thank you for your openness and uh, affaire à suivre. <laughs> Okay, so I think basically the, the takeaway for this is that there's not a winner or a loser. I think we're all in front of the same problem. I'd like to bring this back to a fundamental design problem. And the key issue is what information society we want to live in. And I think this is a design issue. If you, if you take the three dimensions of design, uh, basically which is desirability, technical feasibility and economic viability. <coughs> the balance of these three dimensions is fun fundamental. And it all starts by desirability. So the key takeaway, in my opinion today, and the key challenge we have moving forward, is how do we put back the people, the people who we design systems and services for, back in the driving seat. And we cater to their needs and what they want as people part of a digital society. And this digital society has to be responsible. And this involves corporations. It involves public policies. Uh, show me some love, Swisscom. All right. 